we're looking at <coughs> Nehemiah, <coughs> a governor of um, Judah, who's gone back from captivity. And the title of our lesson this morning is Knowing and Doing God's Will. A little background. The nation of Judah has transgressed and gone into captivity to the nation of Babylon for 70 years. <clears throat> Babylon has been conquered by a nation called Persia. And <clears throat> the Jews that have been in captivity are now free to go back at the end of 70 years. A uh, remnant of them goes back under the um, <clears throat> authority of a man named Zerubbabel. They go back, they build the temple. And <clears throat> God moves upon them and restore the worship of God and the society of God. Well, <clears throat> we find that at some time later, another man named Ezra goes down to uh, <clears throat> the uh, people, and he finds that the nation is in disarray. They have intermarried with the um, people of the land that have been put there by their captors, and there's a high degree of um, mis mixing yeah. of the culture. And Ezra goes about restoring the nation to a state of purity and uh, ridding the uh, influence of the pagan people that have intermarried with the Jews. And <clears throat> a period of time elapses, and we look at the third governor of Judah, a man named Nehemiah. Ne <clears throat> Nehemiah is... Uh, in a high position. He is uh, the cupbearer to the king. It is, he brings him his um, <clears throat> food and drink and he waits on him. And in this capacity, Nehemiah discovers that the nation again has fallen into disarray. So we're going to take a look at Nehemiah, the first chapter, and we're going to read verses 1 to 4 which give us the understanding of how this information comes to Nehemiah. Nehemiah in the first chapter, verses 1 to 4. Wait till everybody gets there. Nehemiah is in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Thank you. Okay. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chilu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that is left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. It came to pass... When I heard these words, then I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now we find Nehemiah is intensely concerned about the state of his people. Nehemiah's heart is broken when he hears about the things that have happened because Nehemiah figured that this, by, this, by this time they would be prospering. Well, just the opposite is taking place. 
the country has literally ground to a halt spiritually. They are not worshiping God. They are not serving God. The society is lying in disarray. They are not doing anything productive to <coughs> get themselves out of the morass that they're in. And Nehemiah says basically the first thing that he does is he isolates himself and gets alone with the Lord. And he pours his heart out to the Lord in this particular capacity. <clears throat> what we find is a principle. Wanting to know the will of God means, number one, forgetting everything else, isolating yourself with God. Emptying yourself of the things of your own will and the circumstances that you're in and being open to the move of the Holy Spirit in your inner being. This is exactly what Nehemiah does. He's filled with a purpose and that purpose is directly in line with God's purpose and it has to do with not his situation but the situation of his people. Now, we find, drop down to verse 11, same chapter, chapter 1, verse 11, Nehemiah is moved to do something. He <clears throat> speaks a prayer to God pertaining to this situation, and then he petitions God to do a specific thing in verse 11. He says, O Lord, I beseech thee. Let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So in other words, Nehemiah is saying, God, I would desire to do something to alleviate the suffering of my people. Give me favor with the king that I might be released to go forth and to aid my people. So we find in the, in the context when God reveals his will to us about a particular thing, then we petition God to give us the ability to do his will in that particular thing. This is exactly what Nehemiah does. He says, give me favor with the king. Now Nehemiah was virtually a slave in this country. Um, he was in a high position, but he was a servant to the king. The king could have taken his life at any time. But Nehemiah was so caught up with the desire to do what had been laid on his heart, to alleviate the suffering of his people, that he was willing to take his life in his hand and go and petition the king. Turn to Nehemiah, the second chapter, verses 1 to 8. We see the result of this. In my second chapter, we're going to read verses 1 to 8. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, this was the king of Persia, Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been beforehand sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. So basically what he does is he goes before the king to do his service, and he's so caught up with the situation of his people that his demeanor is one of sadness. And the king picks up on this. The king says, what's bothering you, Nehemiah? Why are you so sad? You haven't been this way before, and I know you're not sick. So he gets the king's attention. And he realizes the situation that he's in now. He is in a position to petition the king, but he also realizes that if he does not do it the right way, his life can be forfeit. Here for you. Uh, I don't know the song yet, but okay. 
realizes that God has opened the door for him. But he needs to have the wisdom and understanding and the leading of God to make it fruitful. So he goes on and <clears throat> picking up verse 3 he said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulcher, that I may build it. So the king is open, and the king says, what would you have me to do? And Nehemiah says, send me back to Jerusalem, to my people. Give me the materials that I need to restore the city, the walls, that my people may be able to continue the service of God. And he just lays it out before the king of what he needs. Verse 6, And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So he tells, tells the king how long it would be for him to achieve what he needs to achieve in return. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may, re <clears throat> that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. The letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace when I pertained to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So we find that he gives a list of the things that he needs. And he asks the king to give him letters of protection because he has to go into different regions of the Persian Empire. And he does not want to be restricted. So the king gives him letters authorizing him to have safe passage through the different provinces that he needs to go until he gets to Judah. And he gives him a letter to the keeper of the forest to give him material that he will be able to reconstruct the wall and reconstruct the, 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 the regions of the nation when he gets there. And he also gives him an escort. So God moves upon the king to give Nehemiah a favor to give him all the things that he needs to restore the nation of Judah back to where God desires it to be. Now this is a principle that we can incorporate in our life. When you know the will of God, after you've petitioned God, and you pray to God to give you favor, God will give you favor in everything you need to carry out His will. Let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the saint will experience times of intense opposition, but God will enable him to overcome it as long as he trusts God. When you set about doing God's will, it is a certainty that you are going to encounter opposition, strict opposition, heavy opposition at times. But God will give you the ability to overcome the opposition as you put your trust in Him. Many Christians flag, they fall aside because of opposition, knowing what the will of God is, but feeling that they can't achieve the will of God because of the opposition. Don't Allow yourself to enter into that mindset. God will give you the strength 
and the ability to overcome whatever comes against you because God wants his will done through you. Now we see examples of this in Nehemiah. Turn to Nehemiah, fourth chapter, verses 1 to 3. Nehemiah 4, verses 1 to 3. We see the beginning of the opposition as soon as he gets into the land. There are individuals there, one guy named uh, Tobias, another guy named Sambalat, who are the chief engineers of all the opposition that's going to come against Nehemiah. These are individuals that are native to the land. When the, when the Jews were uplifted, uprooted, other people entered into the land and took up residence. Just like you have in Israel today, you have the Palestinians over there who are claiming the land and wanting uh, the things that God had promised to his people. The same thing was true in this time. When they came back, they find foreigners in the land demanding the right to um, live there and do what they want to do and set up their own culture and their own society. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. But it came to pass that when Sambalat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned. And now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up and shall break down their stone wall, hear, O God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. So Nehemiah prays to God to enable him to go forth doing what God has called him to do. Illustrating a principle when you run into opposition, don't try to stand against the opposition in your own strength. Bring God into the situation immediately. Turn to God. Understand that God will give you the strength and the ability to overcome that which is trying to withstand you. Now, this was not just a one-time occurrence. This was consistently happening. Consistently happening. Drop down to Nehemiah. You're in the fourth chapter, verses 7 to 9. Verses 7 to 9. The enemies initially mocked them, trying to undermine their desire to do God's will, and then they forcefully tried to threaten them. Verses 7 to 9. It came to pass that when Shabbat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then were they very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. <clears throat> and Judah said, The strength of the bearers of the burden is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, They shall not know neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. So we find that the opposition is getting greater and greater and greater. And even the people are beginning to weaken and they're looking at the things that they have to do. And they're saying, well, there's too much for us to do. There's not enough people. Uh, we can't do this. All this is coming down on Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, what's Nehemiah doing? Nehemiah is focusing on God. God give us the strength. God give us the will. And Nehemiah sends an edict because uh, Sambalat and Tobiah and the rest of these guys are saying, well, we're going to come in against you when you're not looking for us at night. And we're going to come up on you and we're going to wipe you out. 
So Nehemiah, under the inspiration of God, tells his people, you go and you build the wall, and with one hand you're going to build the wall, and with the other hand you're going to have your sword by your side. And you let them know, if they come and try to take down the work of God by force, we're waiting for them. And they reached the point where they divided the workers into two groups. One group would work on the wall, and the other group would stand guard with their swords. And there were other times when they had women and children with them. There were other times when day and night they had to literally sleep with one eye open because of the enemy. The, the wall was the protection of the city. Every city in those days had a wall to fortify it against attack. Jerusalem didn't have a wall, so the enemy could come upon them at any time. They had no defense. And they were using this in a way in which they would threaten, pressure the Jews to stop this work. But God strengthened Nehemiah. Nehemiah strengthened the people. And it took months for this wall to get built. And every day and every night, the enemy was trying to wear them down psychologically, giving them, a, try to put fear in them to believe that at any time they'd, be, they'd come under attack. But Nehemiah didn't fall for it. Then later on, the enemy changes his tactics. He says, okay, well, we're going to meet with you. We want you, we want you to stop and work on the wall and meet us at such and such a place, and we're going to discuss this. Nehemiah said, no, we're not stopping the work. We're not meeting with you. We've got nothing to do with you. And he kept on going. And the enemy kept on doing things to try to get them to stop the work of God, to halt the work of God. But Nehemiah <coughs> dug in his heels, was steadfast, and refused to do anything until that wall was completed. Turn to Nehemiah. You're in the fourth chapter, verse 11 to 14. 11 to 14. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. It came to pass, and when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us, Ten times from all places whence we shall return, unto us they shall be upon you. <clears throat> so they send ten warnings that they're going to wipe them out. Verse 13, Therefore sent I in the lower places behind mm -hmm. the wall, and on the high places, I even sent the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters your wives, and your houses. So God strengthened Nehemiah. Nehemiah strengthens his people. And they got the wall completed. Now, this brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches, doing the will of God involves an attitude of tenacity. What is tenacity? Tenacity is stubborn persistence. You're going to encounter opposition. And when you encounter the opposition, you dig in your heels, and you don't regard what the opposition is all about. You just go forward with your mind focused on what God has given you to do. And you develop a tenacity. I remember a friend of mine who used to go to Bible study. We were having home Bible studies at uh, the house. He was telling me about it. He came on a situation where these two dogs were fighting. There was this big, bruisy dog, and then there was this little chihuahua-sized dog who got into a fight. And the big dog grabbed the little chihuahua-sized dog, and he just shook him and shook him and shook him. And then he threw him down, and the little dog hit the ground and ran back and jumped up on this big dog's ear 
<laughs> and Jordan. bit his ear in such a way that the dog couldn't shake this little dog off. And this little dog was bleeding. His eye had ripped out. But he would not let go of that big dog. And my friend came across the scene. And he was so impressed. This little dog was just about gone. But he was gripping that dog with everything that was in him. And so he finally got the little dog loose, chased away the big dog, and he took that little dog and he nursed him back to health and he became his pet. Because of that little guy's tenacity. Tenacity. He would not give up. We ought to have the same bulldog tenacity. Dig in your heels. Do not let the enemy overrun you when you know what God's will is for your life. Don't let yourself be robbed or deceived out of what God has for you because if you are faithful to do what God has called you to do, God will greatly favor you and greatly reward you when you leave this place. I want to take a look at some scriptures that tell us the attitude that we're supposed to have. <clears throat> 1 Timothy, 6th chapter, verse 11 to 12. 1 Timothy, 6th chapter, verse 11 to 12. Paul writes to his young son in the faith, Timothy, who's going through some struggles and has been flagging in his faith his commitment. Paul writes this letter to him to assure him and strengthen him. <clears throat> Verse 11, he says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, <clears throat> and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So he, he reminds Timothy that you're in a fight, Timothy. And unless you're fighting, you're going to go down to defeat. So you turn your circumstances around by aggressively pursuing what God has called you to do. You get up, you stand up, and you fight. And God will give you the victory. Turn to Galatians, 5th chapter, verse 1. Galatians, the 5th chapter, verse 1. Right after the book of 2 Corinthians, you come to the book of Galatians. When you get to Galatians, you want the 5th chapter get to the fifth chapter, you want verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In Christ we have been set free from all the influence, all the things that this world would try to bring upon us, we are free of that. The only way that we can experience that stuff is if we allow it to come back into our life. And the only way you can keep it out of your life is to fight against it. And Paul says, stand fast in the liberty and the freedom wherewith Christ has set us free. And don't allow yourself to be drawn back into the yoke of bondage by circumstances, by deceptions, by the allurements of this world. Stand free and remain free in Christ. Now turn to Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1 to 2. What is the prerequisite? For remaining free, for even getting free. 
How does a Christian get under bondage in the first place? And how does he stay out of bondage? Understanding that Nehemiah, Ezra, <coughs> and those that we read about are Old Testament saints, Old Covenant saints. They did not have what we have, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They did not have the power that we have. They did not have the revelation knowledge that we have. Therefore, we are on a higher, much higher level than they were. We are in a position to do things that they couldn't begin to dream to do because we have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And that power is far beyond anything the enemy could possibly bring to bear. Having said that, Paul talks about having the power within us manifest so that we can experience the life of Christ. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1 to 2, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that initially it starts with the desire to commit to live the God life. That's a prerequisite. What does that mean? That means that you have a mindset in which you are going to lay it all down for the Lord. You are not going to compromise your walk with God. That's the prerequisite for me becoming free. Living a life which is wholly pleasing to God in every way that you can. It's talking about sacrifice. What does that mean? That means that you've embraced God's will, not your own will, to begin with. And when you, when you reach that mindset that it's God's will that's going to run your life, not your own will, you're well on the way to breaking the shackles of bondage in this life. And then Paul goes on. He says, once you achieve this, once you achieve the mandate that you become free, Verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is he saying here? He's saying this is where the opposition comes in. Once you become free, then the, the enemy is going to try to bring you back into bondage any way he can. And usually Christians go into bondage through the allurements of either the flesh or the world. And he says, be not conformed to this world. In other words, you do not follow the leading of the world any longer. You do not follow the leading of your emotions, your will any longer. <clears throat> you stand totally in subjection to the will of God and the things of God and the priorities of God. And you reach a stage where you do not compromise God's priority, God's will in your life. And when you determine that, then you will know God's will immediately. God's will will manifest in your life because you have been determined that you're going to live God's will, not your own will. So it automatically comes to you. Then he says, when you get God's will, then you spend your time proving God's will. In other words, putting it to the test. God wants me to do this, I'm going to do this. And God will give me favor in this particular area. And your life becomes filled with the favor of God, the <clears throat> blessings of God, and the things of God. And the things of the world become less and less and less important, less and less and less influential in your life. And he talks about <clears throat> knowing Proving and living the, the perfect will of God. Doesn't mean we don't have problems. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. It means that we know where we're going. It means we know what our relationship with is in God. Nobody can deceive us out of what God has already brought us to understand. 
And in closing, 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 4 to 5. 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 4 to 5. The enemy will continue to come at you as long as you're in this world. But his ability to influence you becomes less and less and less as you become stronger and stronger and stronger in the will and the way of God. The enemy will come against your mind to try to influence your thoughts, to put his own thoughts into your mind stream, to make you think that his thoughts are your thoughts so you'll act upon them and deviate from the path that God has put you on. Paul talks about the counter for that, 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 4 to 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, those things that have been lodged in the mind that restrict the ability of the individual to live the Christ life. You demolish those obstacles in your mind, and you eventually you walk free from them. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A mind is the seat of our success or our failure as Christians. When we pursue the Word of God, when we fill a mind with the Word of God, then when something contrary to the Word of God tries to slip into our thought stream, we understand it, we recognize it, and we cast it out. It is not flowing in the will of God or the way of God. The key to this is reaching a point where you become proficient in understanding the Word of God. There is no way around it. You have to study the Bible Learn the Bible because the Bible is the Word of God. And apply the things of the Bible to your life. Fill your mind with the Word of God. And the enemy will not have an ability to build a stronghold in your mind, which would bring you into captivity. You will walk free your entire life. And not only will you walk free, you'll be free to free others who are in bondage. You'll be able to speak the things that they need in their life to overcome the obstacles that they're dealing with. This is what God has called us to. This is the basic will of God. That we walk free and then we use His lights to free up others who are in bondage. The more you do this, the stronger you become. The more your life becomes a blessing to others. And the more glory you're going to achieve in eternity. So in closing, Understand, knowing and willing, knowing and doing the will of God is a lifetime pursuit. And as you begin on this path, God will give you greater and greater and greater understanding of not only Him, but you. How you operate, who you are in Christ, what your calling is, what your destiny is, and every day becomes exciting, and every day there's so much to do, and every day you feel a sense of accomplishment when you lay your head down on your pillow at night because you know you have pleased God with the time that you've had here. Praise the Lord. Sharon, would you ask the Lord's blessing on his people?